Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the United Nations General Assembly? What is the General Assembly doing to deal with major issues such as climate change, health, education, and poverty? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're looking at the United Nations General Assembly and the role it plays in dealing with many issues that affect basically 7.2 billion people on planet Earth. My guest today is an expert on both the General Assembly and these issues. My guest today is His Excellency Ambassador John Ash. Mr. Ash, the ambassador from Antigua and Barbuda, has represented his country for nine years at the General Assembly. Recently, he was elected, selected to be the president of the 68th General Assembly at the United Nations. Your Excellency, John Ash, welcome to Global Connections Program. Good day. I, it's I, a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. First off, congratulations on being selected. That's a tremendous honor. The General Assembly selects a president each year to be the leader, basically, of the General Assembly and of 193 countries to be selected by your peers. It's really a tremendous honor, and I appreciate you being with me today. Let's talk a little bit about the, ge excuse me, the General Assembly. What is the General Assembly, what, is it, what are its major functions? Well, the General Assembly is um, one of the two major bodies of the United Nations. The other, which is in the news of late, is the Security Council. But the General Assembly is where all the member states of the UN have um, an equal voice. They each, each has an equal voice. So it's one country, one vote in the General Assembly. Currently there are 193 member states of the UN and as the last word implies assembly, this is where they all come together um, for the annual sessions of the General Assembly, which begins in September of each year. Now, it's often been said, I don't know if it's accurate, but it's often been said that the General Assembly is the meeting hall of the world. The 193 countries, basically every country in the world, is a member of the General Assembly. Indeed. And as you mentioned, it's one country, one vote. Antigua and Barbuda, you have approximately, what, 100,000 people? Or maybe a little less. A little less, right, okay. Right, right. And a country, a larger country, uh, such as China with 1.3 billion, right. it's still one, one country, one, one vote. vote. Yes. What, why is it so important, though, to bring all of the countries of the world together and to bring them under one roof to focus on these problems as opposed to some other type of venue that maybe wouldn't be quite as equal or they wouldn't have the voice that they have at the General Assembly? That's, that's a very good question. Um, I always... I've always said that if the General Assembly was not there, it would have to be created. So it's a good thing it's there because it's the, the only known forum where a country such as mine, with about 80,000 people, has the same voice as a much larger country with the one, perhaps the one you cited, with over a billion people. Um, no other forum or fora in the world you can get this kind of equality between states. So I think it's an important venue. And in addition to that, it's its convenient power that makes the General Assembly such a unique organization. It, it certainly is and it certainly does. As, as you look at the General Assembly, and you've been here nine years now, so you've, you've had quite a bit of experience with a wide range of General Assemblies and, and uh, issues and that type of thing. What do you think will be the major, or what are the major issues confronting the 68th General Assembly? Um, well, for the benefit of your viewers, the General Assembly has um, a standard um, 
set of agenda items, uh, many of which just roll over from session to session. Okay. Um, overlaid on that is the um, priorities, which the President of the General Assembly is allowed to um, identify and ask member states to consider. So for the upcoming session, the 68th session, I have asked member states to look at the post-2015 development agenda. And my specific theme for the 60th session is the post-2015 development agenda set in the stage. Th now, why is this important? Um, hitherto, the UN or the General Assembly, um, particularly the current session and the previous one, looked at one aspect of the UN's work, peace and security. The, there's a feeling, given that the majority of the member states are developing countries, that the development portfolio has been largely overlooked. The UN is in the process of defining a development agenda that would take the place of the Millennium Development Goals, which as you know are supposed to come to fruition in, 20, in 2015. So it is my view that member states ought to turn their attention to that exercise given its importance. It, that's very true. And just uh, to go back a little bit, those Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. were so critical. They were adopted in 2000 by the majority of the states, the members of the General Assembly, mm -hmm. uh, to basically eight logical, objective, measurable goals to reduce abject poverty by 50%, mm -hmm. to promote universal primary school education, empower women, reverse the AIDS pandemic, and four others. And they were so important, and they were on a 15-year time continuum. As you mentioned, they expire in 2015. But the idea is not to just quit and say, well, many countries have achieved some of the goals, all of the goals, or maybe none of the goals, whichever mm -hmm. the case might be, but right. to keep that process alive and to move it forward. And so that will be one of your main functions? Well, yes, the short answer to that is yes. But if you could step back a bit, um, of course, the idea was that all these goals will reach, um, will, uh, will have achieved their, their, their um, individual objectives by, twi by 2015. But um, a number of things have conspired to prevent that. Um, most recent were the, the multiple crises of 2008, 2009, which I think have set back development writ large um, significantly. And so there's been a recalibration. And it's, um, I think the prevailing view is that the international community will fall short of the objectives of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Irrespective of that, though, some countries, as you have um, correctly noted, did achieve um, the goals, others not, but something needs to be done come 2015. And that's what the process I hope to begin um, starting with the 60th session. Mm -hmm. And these are so vitally important. And it was really, I think, a stroke of genius. That's just from an outsider's viewpoint, you understand. Right when, I guess it was Kofi Annan, when he right. was Secretary General of the United Nations mm -hmm. who came up with this idea and said that we, there are a lot of issues before the General Assembly and mm -hmm. the, the UN system, and right. the entire system, but we need to galvanize and focus our attention on at least these eight. Mm -hmm. There are other issues going on and we can right. focus on, but I think it's really helped mobilize large parts of the world. We, we hear about faith-based groups that have signed on to help achieve the Millennium Development Goals, service clubs like Rotary International, Lions International, you have youth groups that are mobilizing, raising money to achieve th some of the Millennium Development Goals. So it's really sort of galvanized the world, has mm -hmm. it not, to a large degree? Well, there's a, um, well I, I have to be careful that there's a certain sexiness about them. Um, they're very concise and um, they're understandable. And um, yes, they did catch on, um, particularly with civil society. But there was also a realization that the goals themselves had or, or did have a number of shortcomings. And currently there's an exercise um, that is going on where the international community is looking at a, a set of successor goals to address a much larger issue, sustainable development, hence the, mm -hmm. the shorthand sustainable, sustainable development goals. And um, it is hoped that out of that exercise will come a set of goals that would pick up on the shortcomings of the MDGs and take them a bit further. Take them to that next step. Yes. That's very important. Indeed. Yes. Now, we hear a lot about 
reform at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Kofi Annan, when he was Secretary General, came in with a two-track approach to improve the internal effectiveness and efficiency of the UN. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has his programs in place to reform to improve the UN, basically, as mm -hmm. any organization wants to improve it, right. to make it more efficient and more effective. And there's no other entity in the world like the United Nations that brings all the leaders of the world together, all 193 countries together. Do you have any proposals to uh, sort of uh, move the General Assembly forward, maybe some internal reforms to make or uh, some way to make it uh, more efficient and that type of thing? Well, um, you're right in noting that um, there's a, a, a two-track approach. The internal reform is within the purview of the Secretary General, as it ought to be. Mm -hmm. There is a larger reform process, and when member states speak of reform, reform, they look at the two main organs, the Security Council and the General Assembly. Um, there is an exercise that has been going on for the past 20 years that is intended to reform the Security Council because it's widely, perhaps universally accepted, that it does not reflect current day realities. When it was formed, the world was a different place. Mm -hmm. And you have a set of countries that believe, given their, their current um, economic standing and other aspects, mm -hmm. that they ought to be members of the Security Council. So that, ex that exercise is ongoing. Sadly, it has not progressed um, in, a, in a satisfactory manner. And so that's one of the things I, I hope to look into how we can spur this reform of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today we're taking a look at a very important organ, one of six organs, but one of the two most important in the United Nations system, and that is the General Assembly. My guest today is an expert on the General Assembly and on the issues it's confronting. My guest today is His Excellency Ambassador John Ash, who was recently elected as President of the 68th General Assembly at the United Nations. Mr. President or Ambassador, we'll do both. <laughs> we'll call you both. Right. Me, you made a really important point. You made several, but the one I don't want to leave at this juncture is when you were talking a few minutes ago right. about the Security Council mm -hmm. and how really it was created, uh, the victors of World War II. They, the five countries, mm -hmm. the, the U.S., right, well, at that time the Soviet Union, China, France, and the U.K., basically came together under sort of the leadership of President Franklin Roosevelt and created the United Nations. And they created the Security Council with this permanent uh, situation where the five permanent members had a veto, mm -hmm. and anyone v could veto any particular issue that came before the Security Council. Now, as I understand, the General Assembly, the recommendations or the resolutions that come out, or they're non-binding. But the Security Council, if it takes a vote on a resolution, it could be very well binding on a country or a particular group of people. Are there some specific ideas that, I know there are a lot of ideas that have been floating around really since back in the 80s probably, or maybe even earlier, about how to change the Security Council and to make it more representative, more democratic, more uh, involved, I guess involving more people. Are there some things that maybe we should be thinking about, or I know you're gonna be looking at, but something that we could uh, think about as uh, just people that from the outside looking in at the, the United Nations? Well, well, happily, there, is no sh there isn't a shortage of ideas about how to reform the organ. Um, the problem or problems that each and every one of those ideas um, um, has is that someone doesn't like it. And given that we tend to do things by consensus, that is not to say we don't vote. I mean, I don't want to give that impression. We do quite frequently. Um, but I think there's a realization that this particular issue, the form of the Security Council, is so important that it it would require, at the minimum, uh, what is called a two-thirds or supermajority mm -hmm. of the member states. And finding a set of proposals that would satisfy two-thirds of the member states is what um, has been the challenge over the years and still is the challenge. Um, but as I said, there are a set of ideas there. Perhaps every conceivable permutation and combination out there about reform, including mm -hmm. 
increasing the number of permanent members. There are currently five. The body itself has 15, so 10 are elected every two years. Um, so increasing the number of permanent members from five to some number. There's no agreement on what that number ought to be. And increasing what we call the non-permanent members, those are elected every two years, from 10 to some other number. Everyone agrees that you need to have a, man a body that is manageable in size. So you're hearing numbers somewhere in the 20s, as high as 30. But again, there's no agreement as what on what would be the ideal size mm -hmm. of the council as a whole, and more importantly, how many permanent members there ought to be and how many non-permanent members. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. There's a proliferation of ideas, yes. lots of right. suggestions out there, right. but how do you get two-thirds to go along with right. it? Because you mentioned somebody is not going to be happy with the proposal, <laughs> right. so we deal with the world we deal with, uh -huh. I guess. Uh -huh. Well, there are so many issues. We look at, and I'm, this show will not air for a couple of weeks, but we look at the situation in Syria, which mm -hmm. will change from day to day, minute to minute. Right. Is there a role? We see that the Security Council has been paralyzed on this one. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Security Council was in agreement on how to d confront the situation in Libya. The Security Council, there is much more of a cooperative rather than confrontational approach, I think, by the members of the Security Council today, as opposed to back during the Cold War, obviously, because right. we fought the Cold War at the Security Council. But t is there something that the General Assembly could do? I know the UN system is on the ground working in Syria to help uh, something like over 2 million refugees out of a population of 22 million. The uh, UN Children's Fund, UN World Health Organization, they're all on the ground. Is there a role for the General Assembly? I know you don't deal with peace and security. The Security Council does per se, but is there something that can be done to help in this particular situation or to uh, perhaps develop programs to be of assistance to the Syrian people? Uh, you, made, you made a point earlier um, in highlighting one of the key differences between both bodies, um, the Security Council and the General Assembly. Um, in the case of the General Assembly, the resolutions that are adopted um, carry a certain moral weight. They have no legal standing and they're not binding on member states. In the case of the Security Council, decisions taken under what is called Article 7 of the Charter have legal standing. And that's where the problem perhaps l is and perhaps where the solution lies. Um, in the case of Syria and specific actions called for by some, it will require action by the Security Council. And only the Security Council can take that decision. And therein lies what many consider to be a dysfunctional organization, if that is the case. Hence the call for reform and all the things that you, you hear about the UN. Mm -hmm. You also, as we've looked at the United Nations over the years, uh, we see that so often that countries, when they cannot deal either individually or perhaps a couple of them, two or three collectively, or even a region, mm -hmm. cannot deal with their particular problems, say mm -hmm. some type of internal civil war, or, uh, perhaps two countries fighting one another, whatever the case might be. But so often countries will bring problems to the United Nations after they've reached that point, I won't say of no return, but mm -hmm. they've really become very intractable at times. Have you seen that as in your nine years up here that so often when the problems are brought to the General Assembly or to, or to the Security Council in particular, that they've really been allowed, uh, not allowed, but they've just developed and developed to the point where they're extremely dangerous and very difficult to deal with? Well, I invariably what happens is that um, the international community is usually called to respond mm -hmm. to something that's happening in a particular region or a particular country. And that's how the UN or its partners, perhaps NATO or whatever, do get involved. Um, but to say that country, yeah, countries do look to the UN ultimately as an arbiter mm -hmm. and as a, as, a, as a neutral one. Um, and it's for the international community to judge whether that is the case in any specific um, circum set of circumstances. But I think um, the UN has that credibility and will always be looked upon or looked to by countries as the ultimate arbiter of, of the um, settle, settle of disputes, so to speak. And the UN does have that credibility, too. It, it's, it's a 
sort of an objective entity to get involved in these particular issues. That's why it can set up mechanisms out there for countries to hold their democratic, peaceful democratic mm -hmm. elections. It can send peacekeepers into areas right. that d really don't take sides and go in and try to work with both sides, let them resolve their, their differences. So it's very important to do that. Before we leave the General Assembly, I've, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, again, I cannot stress how wonderful it is that you've been elected as president of the 68th General Assembly, and it's a tremendous honor. What, I don't go into great detail, but what is the process? Are you, uh, is, does your region nominate someone to be president of the General Assembly? Does it work like that? The, the Latin American Caribbean region would nominate you to be the, the president of the General Assembly? Or how, how does that w process work? Well, um, I, it may not be typical for every, every member state of the UN, but, um, most member states belong to multiple groups. Mm -hmm. in, in, in my specific case, and um, Antigua and Barbuda, we are a member of um, a group known as CARICOM, Caribbean Community. Mm -hmm. Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And we do take joint decisions. Um, we strive for common foreign policy and, and our heads meet regularly, that sort of thing. Within that, um, there's a broader group, which is the Latin American and the Caribbean group. Mm -hmm. Um, the way the process works, re-elections um, for, the, for the President of the General Assembly, is that it re the candidate requires the endorsement of his or her regional group in. In my case, it would be Latin America and the Caribbean. But my first step was to get the support of my sub-regional group, which is the CARICAM. And then, collectively, we took that to the wider Latin America and Caribbean group. Mm -hmm. There are instances, as has happened where a candidate does not receive the endorsement of his or her regional group and is brought to a vote of the entire membership. I see. But usually it's by acclamation, as it was in my case. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating process. It certainly is and one that uh, it. Uh, we, uh, I'd like to read a book about it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> right, Maybe right. you should write it. All right, there you <laughs> you <go>. could do <laughs> that. <laughs> Before we run out of time, there are a couple of other items I'd like to, to get to. One, the United Nations, the General Assembly in mm -hmm. particular, has developed over the years international days to focus attention on particular issues and problems and to make people aware of them and to really to help mobilize support mm -hmm. from a wide range of entities to be involved in dealing with those issues like the International Day of Women, International Day of AIDS, different things like different activities and, and groups like that. One is the International Day of Peace that right. is now has been designated September 21st, and not only is it celebrated at the United Nations on or around that day, but there are literally tens of thousands of activities around the world. Why is it important for people, everybody, all 7.2 billion people, all non-governmental organizations, governments, whatever, to take at least one day a year, hopefully all 365, to take one day a year to focus on the International Day of Peace, to think about it, to maybe to implement or develop a strategy or a plan to help promote peace, not only in their communities, in their countries, but around the world. Why is that so important? Well, speaking to the larger issue of, of, of focusing on, on a particular su subject area, subject matter, uh, I think in the normal course of things, there's so many things going on in one's lives. So you would normally, in the, c in the course of a day, think, oh man, let me just take a moment to think about peace somewhere. And I think that's the particular attractiveness, I would hope, of these international days. For that one day of the year, because of the hype that goes prior to that day, people take a moment, however brief, just to focus on that particular issue. And I think that's the good thing about that. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. Well, there's so many other issues we could talk about. One that's widely viewed, I know an interview you and I did about two, two and a half years ago, we talked about it most of the program. We won't be able to today, but is climate change. That is with us. 97% uh, of the climate change scientists out there believe that it's happening. They're all not convinced what the final end result is, but it's getting worse and worse. Is, uh, will this be an issue that will be on the agenda at the General Assembly that you'll be discussing climate change and uh, countries will bring various proposals forward? Well, the General Assembly um, does not specifically deal with the matter because there's a separate negotiating track that has been set up. Mm -hmm. um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC is called. Um, and they're in the process of um, 
negotiating a what is called a, um, a comprehensive um, treaty, which is supposed to be in place by 2015. Um, currently, what we have um, are treaties that only look at one set of countries and mm -hmm. ask them to assume binding commitments. Of course, that would not ultimately address the problem. So there's, a, there's been agreement that it has to be a, a broader collective effort. And this is, and this is what's um, on the way at, as we speak. Mm -hmm. It will come and culminate sometime in 2015, hopefully with an agreement in which all, all countries, all member mm -hmm. states do have commitments to reduce greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador John Ash from Antigua and Barbuda, President of the 68th General Assembly. These are very important issues, and our viewers can go to un.org and get a lot more information or just Google the issues, and they will pop up. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting <laughs> and a very informative program. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program. <laughs>